great being with you this morning and with all you folk. Um, this is going to be a, a different type of service, different type of presentation. Uh, I'm going to be using the screen a lot, so if you can't see the screen, I need you to move because you'll be cranking your neck an awful lot. Of, so there's lots of room to spread out if you need to. Um, after we finish, if you don't have a will or power of attorney documents, uh, we can help you with that. And uh, as I get through the presentation, you'll understand a little bit more about that. But it's a, a, a free service that we offer to all of our people across Canada. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet. It's a first-come, first-serve idea. And um, if you run into problems when you're trying to sign up, come and talk to me. And I'm sure we can work out something that will help you and uh, make sure everybody is serviced, okay? Um, I want to start off with some scripture. It's in a inter very interesting portion in Luke 16. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. That's quite a deal, isn't it? Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus ended this by saying, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Very interesting passage. I use it as a backdrop of what I want to talk about. There are six principles I want to talk about this morning. Most pastors, when they preach on a Sunday morning, have three principles. Hey, we're, we're going to have six this morning, okay? Find the spot marked X. In other words, where are you financially? Set some goals. We're talking about financial goals. And of course, once you set those goals, you have to determine how to reach them. That's what you call creating a financial plan. Number four, manage your spending. Now, in our churches, we do a pretty good job, I think, about talking about the tithe, the 10%. But not very often do we go over into that other 90%. Well, I want to go there this morning, okay, and share with you some very interesting stuff. Plan for retirement. Some of you here are retired. The rest of you wish you were. <laughs> doing number six, doing the final touches, estate planning, very important area, and we will get to that. But let's go back to spot number one. It's difficult to follow directions if you don't know where you are. Now, you ladies will understand this better than the guys because generally ladies like to shop. And say you go to this big mall and you're looking for a particular shoe store. And for our example, say, let's say that shoe store is in this big mall. This area looks like a maze unless you come and find a spot where they call a spot marked X. It, 
you know, this, this uh, place where I have all the stores listed and the floor plan there. You see, it's difficult to follow directions if you don't know where you are. Now, the same is true with your money. If you don't know where you are this morning, it's pretty hard for me to get you anywhere. So let's start back at the principle number one, finding the spot marked X. First thing I want you to do is, yeah, be honest. <laughs> it's amazing. Money is so personal and so private. Sometimes we don't even want to go there. But let's go there this morning. Be honest. Secondly, be open. If you're really going to find out what, what it's like, you have to put everything on the table. All the credit cards, all the, the bills that aren't paid, like there could be no surprises. Thirdly, be thoughtful. How did you get to this spot? Like, if you're not doing well financially, maybe it's not all your fault. Maybe, you know, you've been uh, sick and uh, the bills keep coming in, or maybe you've been laid off, can't find a job, or uh, uh, maybe, you know, there's just other things that are, are, that are, are sort of surping up your money, and you, you need to address that. Um, number four, when you talk about money, it's okay to get worked up. <laughs> Um, as I cross the country, I do find a lot of people are concerned and anxious, not knowing what the future will hold for them. The markets aren't very trustworthy. They keep going up and down. Um, but also, how many of you understand that money has a lot to do with relationships between spouses? I kind of like this picture because it, it uh, says a lot in a short time. Apparently... Yeah, he's getting it, I think. Apparently, I've done something to upset. Listen, if you have that problem, pastor's available, okay? I need to go on. Uh, I, want to talk, I want you to know that when we talk about money, there's a lot of hope, okay, even in your situation. Did you know that the, God has given us more than 2,350 verses in the Bible to instruct us how to manage our money, assets, and resources? Listen, I grew up in church. And there was this idea that you should never talk about money in church because people would think you're after their money, right? The Bible has so much to say about it, you better talk about it, right? In fact, the topic of money is second only to the topic of love in the number of times the Word of God confronts the subject. Jesus said more about money and possessions than almost any other subject, dedicating over two-thirds of his parables to the subject, Okay. Can you give me the okay to talk about money this morning? Yeah, I'm going to talk about it in a way. <laughs> Let's go back, finding the spot marked X. I want to introduce this law, uh, double law of finances to you. The first O represents everything that you own. The second O represents everything that you owe. Now, when you take one from the O from the other, you get your net worth. Every time you go to borrow money, that's what they're after. How much are you really worth? And I hope they don't have to say, uh-oh. Oh. All right. Let me give you an illustration. Things that we own. House, automobiles, maybe some mutual funds, retirement. Let's put some figures in there just to make this uh, a little bit more feasible. Um, this guy, he has a, a house of about 200000 automobiles about thirty. He has an, uh, an RV of about 40000 um, mutuals of about 75, uh, RSPs of about 60, um, savings of about, so the total of what he owns is 410,000. That's the first O we talked about. Now the second O, how much do we owe? Let's see what he does here. Uh, in a house he still owes 100,000, his automobiles 20,000, RV getting it down, it down to 10,000. Um, on loans, he has a line of credit that's, that's uh, nothing on it. The credit cards are 10000 Oh, yeah, remember I said everything had to be on the table? Mother-in-law, 5000 So the total of what he owns is 145000 So you take one from the other, your net worth, his net worth is 275000 I want you to do that for your own situation. How much do you own? How much do you owe? And then where are you really at, Okay. Now, once we know where we are, let's talk about setting some goals. Um, uh, you know, here, you want to get from here to there in your, in your financial plan. We're talking about short-term goals. We'll, we'll look at long-term goals a little later on. 
But let me set a framework for you. Goals must be what we call specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be attainable, okay? Be realistic, in other words, okay? And they also, they need to be within a certain time frame. Like, it's a smart thing to determine how you want to spend your money. So take the time and write down these goals that you want to accomplish in the next three to five years. Now, once you do that, then we have to determine how to reach them. That's what we call creating a financial plan. Now, in creating a financial plan, the first thing I want you to do is this. Make a commitment to God. It's amazing how God comes around and helps us as we take his word and actually read it. As we get down on our face and seek him, it's amazing how God helps us. In fact, the Bible says it this way, commit to the Lord whatever you do in your plans will succeed. Awesome verse, okay? Secondly, get help from informed people and reliable resources in your church, in your community, all kinds of people whose expertise is money, uh, bankers, lawyers, financial advisors, financial counselors. Like if you have a financial situation you're dealing with, why don't you go to one of these people and, and ask them for some advice? Let them help you frame what you're facing and the alternatives you have to meet that situation. Don't just try doing it all on your own. Reach out and let people help you. There's all kinds of resources out there. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. Seeking to understand your situation is to your benefit, as surely as haste leads to poverty. So make a commitment to God. Get help and inform people and reliable resources. Then I want to do this. I want to invoke the old McDonald law of economics. I'm wanting to use, you know that old song, E-I-E-I-O? I'm wanting to use that, that formula to set up a financial plan. Now, uh, the first E-I stands for what's your expected income? How much money do you make? So we, we, we have our wages, maybe pensions, investment. Let's put some figures in there as well. Okay, this guy makes about six grand a month. He has some interest investment he gets 500 from a month. He does some rental uh, uh, area that he gets about 1,500 and he does a little bit of work on the side. So his total expected income is 8,600. That's what he makes in a given month. Now, that's the first EI, expected income. The second EI stands for how much money do you spend in a given month? And we're going to look at, you know, the tithe, the household expense. Let, let's put our figures in there. Um, so our tithe on that situation would be about 800. Offerings, about 200. Uh, food and clothing, et cetera, about 1,800. Uh, in, uh, insurance repairs, 500. Um, pensions, RSP, uh, 500. TFSA, 500. Um, mortgages, uh, debts, about 42. So what his expenses add up to is 8,600. Now, ex uh, expected income, 86. Expenses, 86. Outcome, before you think that that's bad, I wish I could get the people in our churches across the country doing at least that good. That's what you call a balanced portfolio, not spending any more than you make. <laughs> it's interesting as I've been able to sit down with a lot of people across the country. I find it kind of interesting how a lot of people are spending more than they make. And you know where that leads to down the road, okay? Now, if you want to better your bottom line, there's one of two ways you can do it. We call it the fire ordinance. Uh, you can better your bottom line if, first of all, you make more money. And you can be as creative as you want. Um, you can work longer hours at your place of employment. Uh, you can have a spouse who goes out to work, so you're a two-income family. Um, you can find a, a need in your community to supply that service charge for it. Like, if you can make more money, your bottom line should come up. But you know what I've discovered? The more money people make, the more they spend, right? So if this is not an option for you, the only other option you have is this, reduce expenses. <laughs> now, I find this one interesting because we in Canada aren't used to cutting back or doing without. 
Like that's the only way you're going to reduce expenses if you cut something out or, or cut back somewhere. Um, you know, most of us don't have a do without list. We sort of have that wish list, you know, bigger home, newer car, bigger toys for bigger boys, all that kind of stuff. But listen, if you're going to reduce expenses, you've got to cut back somewhere. Now, don't come to me to, uh, and ask me how, where you should cut back. I need you to do that homework for you because you would not believe me or want to do what I would suggest. You have to determine to cut back. In fact, there's a kind of an interesting slogan, no pain, no gain. Okay, two ways to uh, better your bottom line. Now, number four, manage your spending. Uh, six important players in all of our lives, whether we're in the church or outside the church, first important player is God. I have the second one as Canada Revenue Agency. You know why I have them second? I don't care where you live, they're going to find you. Right? <laughs> Thirdly, you and your family. Our world circulates around our family. Our employer, the place we receive our principal income from. Our creditors, yeah, they're important. You know, um, it, you've, you've spent money, you know, taking out loans, you have to pay it back, okay? And, but the, th uh, the last one is our neighbor. And I want to talk about each of these individually, okay? Let's go back to the first one. God comes first. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, we all give mental assent to that very quickly, don't we? But do we actually do it? How often we're running around in circles trying to figure things out instead of saying, hey, God, I need some help here, right? Seek first his kingdom. What about this one? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Only verse in the Bible where God says, test me in this and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room to contain it. The Bible says, but seek, bring, I mean, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Tithing is a very interesting principle. Um, it has more to do with a spiritual walk than it does with your finances. Okay? You see, the way I explain tithing is this way. Um, when you walk in obedience to the word of God, you invite God into your world, Right? And when God's in your world, he works miracles because he's just that kind of a God. But when you walk in disobedience to the word of God, you know what you're doing? You're pushing God out of your world. You're telling God, hey, I can take care of this. I'm, a, I'm good. Yeah, he'll let you do that too. Okay? I kind of like having God in my world. Okay? But it says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. <laughs> um, Pastor, I grew up in church. Okay? I slept under the pew. We had pews in our church. I slept under there just like Le Levi, okay, about that size, all right? Um, Dad was a long-winded preacher. Um, but, you, you know, it's important to, to understand what the Word of God says, okay? Bring the whole tithe, not just what you have left over, but what comes off your paycheck first is God's mouth, okay? And you'll find that he will help you in all these areas that you were struggling with. He, he won't take away all your problems. You'll have to do some cutting and, and adjusting to make sure it happens. But God will be there and you'll look back and see, oh, God blessed me in this. Or this is what God has done, okay? Test me in this and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven. I need to move on. I like this verse. Remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That's the principles of God. Each man should give what he determined his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. A and I like this part too. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 
Listen, God's interested in his people. He's interested in you, okay? And as you walk in obedience to him, he will help. He'll take care of you. In fact, that's how I summarize this verse. You know, do as he says and he'll take care of you, okay? I need to move on. God comes first. <laughs> the tax man. Uh, I have a tech at the national office because I use this. I'm, uh, and I'm also glad that Matt's around. He does a lot, big, good job here. But my tech at the national office, he, he got his tax bill and he wasn't very happy with it. So he sits down at his computer and he sits for a while right, thinking what he's going to say. And he comes up with this. I am writing to cancel my subscription. <laughs> Please remove my name from your mailing list. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, listen, let me give you the good news first. Revenue Canada actually encourages us to, to uh, reach out and help others. Uh, charities and volunteers can do a far better job than they can, and so they made all kinds of tax concessions to encourage you and I to become involved in charitable giving. In fact, uh, about 45% of the amount you give to your church or charitable donation will come back to you as a, in a tax receipt. Uh, other um, it actually begin, you know, it's been money that's been deducted from our earnings. Uh, other laws tell us that uh, we can receive a tax credit up to 75% of our taxable income. Also, if you, a state gives to a charity, they can claim the total 100% of that amount. And uh, um, the other news is we do live in one of the best countries in the world, but it's important we pay our fair share of taxes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, okay? To God what is God's, okay? And in this whole area of taxes and filing them, maybe it's to your advantage to get some advice. Most of us can't keep up to the laws that change out there and often are missing things that we could claim. And so I find it probably is to your advantage to reach out to people that, that work in this area and get some advice for them. Here's some tax saving ideas. Um, if you uh, uh, have stocks or shares, when you donate uh, stocks or mutual funds or other types of securities to the PAOC, you pay no capital gains tax, but you receive a tax receipt for the full amount of that market value of that security at the date that we receive them. Kind of an interesting scenario here. Uh, oftentimes because of um, capital gains involved or uh, mutual funds, if you have to bring them all in at one time, you lose half of them. Well, here you can get a tax receipt for the full amount of them, and uh, it can be uh, a great help to the kingdom of God. Or if you have all the mo all the money that you want to leave uh, uh, in the PLC Foundation and utilize tax receipts from that ministry, you, you tell us where you want those uh, uh, those funds to go and we will handle them for you so you get your tax receipts when you need them. If you're older, here's another area that is kind of interesting. Um, Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada gift annuities um, pay out regular payments, not only your lifetime, but the lifetime of your spouse. The interest rate is based on your age, so the older you are, the higher the interest you will get paid. And a large percent, or if not all of it, is tax-free. I'll give you a, an illustration and I'll run from it. Say you're 72 years of age and you want to make a $10,000 gift annuity. Our charts tell us we can pay you 6.5%. That's a pretty good amount. But also 85% of the amount you receive is tax-free. That's like getting, you know, if you were outside investing somewhere, you'd have to get 10, 10.5% to equal what uh, that uh, type of investment would give you. Uh, if you're interested, just talk to me about that one, okay? I uh, need to move on. You and your family. Saving for the rainy day. It's suggested that we have an emergency fund of about six months set up um, uh, for when emergencies come. Now, if you don't, if you spend everything, in fact, I'm told that 60% of Canadians live from paycheck to paycheck, when emergencies come, then they have to go into debt and then start trying to pay it off. Why not just set some money aside? And you can do that by starting a, a, a tax-free savings account and have an automatic transfer out. You probably won't notice it that much, okay? 
Or have you ever considered the uh, formula 10, 10, 80? 10% for the Lord's work, 10% for savings, and make your budget on the 80% that's left. That one works real well. Um, the Bible says, in the house of the wise are stores of choice foods and oils, but a foolish man devours all that he has. Uh, I need to move on. Your creditors, uh, um, the Bible says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. We are told that the household debt in Canada is continuing to rise at a higher rate than the income that's coming in. And so getting out of debt is a very important thing for families to do. How to get out of debt? Let me give you some, uh, some suggestions. First of all, stop credit card spending or any form of borrowing. <laughs> uh, very important. Pay off debts charging the highest interest first. Put the minimum on the other debts, but the one that has the highest, pay it off as quickly as you can, then cut that credit card up. You really don't need it, all right? Develop a budget. Maybe you have a budget in your mind. Why don't you put it down on paper? It should look like something like this. Um, uh, and it's, it's on page 18 in your booklet, the spending plan. Uh, God share 10, housing 30%, and put your own, maybe your own figures in there just to see how they measure up to those, um, uh, those uh, uh, landmarks there. And, um, but develop a budget. Um, I really don't care if you follow it, but at least you know what you should be doing in these different areas, okay? It gives you a little bit of control and, and, uh, on that area. How uh, to get out of debt. Exercise self-discipline as a lifestyle. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, why do Canadians, when they see something they really like, but don't have money for it, they'll buy it anyway? <laughs> uh, it's kind of, there's some gymnastics that go along in the mind. Like, they say to themselves, well, everybody else has it. And I say, so? Or they say, there'll never be a sale like this one again. <laughs> Or what about this one? Look how much money I can save if I buy it now. But they haven't you know, looked at the interest that they're going to have to pay before they get it paid off. Someone put it this way. Canadians buy things they really don't need with money they don't have to impress people they don't even like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exercise self-discipline of life. Huh? Uh, consider lifestyle adjustments. Seek counsel. Learn to trust in God. Remember... Jesus said to the rich farmer who pulled down his barns and built greater ones, he said, life doesn't consist in the abundance of things that you surround yourself with. You buy this, you buy this. Never comes a time when there's not something left to buy, right? You know why? Th possessions, things do not bring satisfaction. They don't bring contentment. That type of thing comes from a relationship with, with God. In, it's in him that we live and move and have our being, Okay. And uh, so uh, learn to trust in God and he will help you walk through those areas. I need to move on. Our neighbor, very important player in our life. Um, in fact, did you know that Christianity actually taught the world about charity? I want to come back to the verse I read this morning, the portion of scripture I read this morning. Because I, as I was putting this together, this kind of stuck out at me. It says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light. That's talking about us, right? I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Another uh, uh, version of the Bible said it this way, and his Lord commended the unrighteous steward because he had done wisely for the sons of this world are for their own generation wiser than the sons of light. I say to you, make, to make for yourselves friends by means of the manna of unrighteousness, that's by using money, so that when it shall fill, you may be received into eternal tabernacles. See, see the, the people of this world serve their God, that is money, with more diligence, ingenuity, fervor, and passion than we who serve the true God. He goes on to say, 
serve God by using money for kingdom purposes, by laying up treasures in heaven, stewardshipping your time, your talent, your treasure into eternal values. Let me just stop for a minute. Life isn't about us. Life isn't about us. We need to have an eternal focus. It's about our neighbors, our kids, yeah, our grandkids. Life's about loving, giving, discipling, mentoring. It's about praying, fasting, sacrificing, even suffering. Life's about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Christ. It's about pleasing God and even heaven rejoicing as we bring people into the kingdom. It's about hearing the words of God, the master, saying, well done. That's what our life's focus should be. Can you say amen? Okay. The aspect of money to the world is totally different to the, the aspect of a Christian. Okay. I need to move on. Plan for retirement. <laughs> These guys had a plan. <laughs> Before you laugh too much, let me ask, what's your plan? What's your plan? I wish somebody had talked to me about this when I was a lot younger, okay? Um, let me show you something. Here's a graph here, and I'll take a pen. Um, in 1961, 7% of the population was over the age of 65, and 42% of the population was under the age of 19. They tell us by 2031, 27% of the population would be over 65, and 14% of the population will be under the age of 19. What's that saying? See, every time you pay into your CPP, that money is not put into a little pocket or sock for you when you retire. It's paid out to the pensioners that, that are drawing from it. Okay? There could come a time when there's more coming out than being put in. And so the CPP was never meant to be a retirement fund. It was meant to help out in retirement. And so if you think you're going to live on CPP and old age security, you're going to be living under the poverty line, <laughs> all right? In fact, Canada pays out the least to its seniors of all the industrialized nations. So maybe planning for retirement, maybe it's something you should look at, you should consider. Let me give you a little bit more information. Um, when you retire, you need to sort of um, determine how much money you want to live on, you need to live on when you retire. I'll put just a, a figure in here. I'm going to put 6,000. I don't know if I make 6,000 here or not. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> financial advisors tell us that we should be able to live on 70% of what we make when we're working. Don't believe it, okay? When you get older, you got grandkids. <laughs> All right. Um, when you retire, and you can pick the age, whether it's 55, 65, 71, uh, first of all, uh, um, let me be back here. Um, your Canada pension is, is a constant payout. Your old age security is a constant payout. Your pension plan is a constant payout. Let me stop there. It's important that our young people understand that they need to have a job where there is a pension plan involved, okay? I'm coming across a lo lot of young adults who are working you know, uh, in, in uh, fields where there is no pension plan, and that's going to hit, hurt them badly when they go to retire, okay? Um, pension plan is a constant payout. Now, if those, three factors don't add up to the 6,000, you only have one other option, and that's the investment option, okay? Uh, RSPs, uh, tax-free savings, real estate, GICs, all stocks, bonds, annuities, like there's all kinds of investments out there that you need to, uh, you can plug into to help out when you retire. 
Now, the, the, that pale is a variable, and then whatever you make should add up to the amount that you want to live on. That's why I say to people, sit down with a financial advisor and work out a, a retirement plan. Look at it at least every five to seven years, okay? But make sure you don't leave this until you're 65 and say, oh, boy, I need to know what I'm making, okay? Um, go to your, find a financial advisor that you trust, and they have the software. They can plug in your particular amounts and tell you what it will look like in those different ages, okay? And then you will be able to adjust your situation in order to properly retire. I need to move on. Take advantage of compound interest. Now, compound interest is basically making interest on interest. It's kind of interesting. Michael, uh, at age 25 to 35, he put in $1,000. Jennifer put 1,000 from age 35 to 45. Sam put 1,000 from age 55 to 65, all right? Now, when they retired, Michael had 1.4 million. Jennifer had 734,000. Sam had about almost 400,000. Compound interest works to your advantage. So young people, start setting aside something now because you have the time factor that us older guys don't have, all right? The sooner you start putting money away, the better it is for you. Take advantage of compound interest. I need to go on to estate planning now. Power of attorney is very important as you get older, okay? Um, while you are still living, and that's the key words to this, um, if you become incapacitated, can't make decisions on your own, you need to have what we call a power of attorney, a substitution decision maker. And they need to be able to make uh, um, choices for you uh, in two areas, the area of finance and the area of health care. Now, in um, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, it's power of attorney for property and health care directive. If you don't have those documents, you need to have them. Uh, if you want us to help you with them, um, we can, and uh, you, you, you'll, you'll find that uh, they will suit your situation. So, these documents are only in effect while you're alive. We'll talk about wills next. They don't, wills only come to an effect when you pass away. They don't overlap, okay? You can use the same people in the, those documents, but know, remember that these are very important as you get older, if something happens, to have somebody who can make decisions for you. I kind of like this guy. He said uh, to his wife, he said, just so you know, I never want to live in a vegetated state dependent on some machine. If that ever happens, just unplug me, okay? Uh, yeah, and she says, okay. <laughs> well, not the machine he had in mind. I need to move on. Listen, today or tomorrow, we'll go to visit that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why, we do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? Your mist that appears for a little while and you're gone. A lot of people don't like talking about this, okay? But you need to. It's reality. We're not here forever, okay? Um, an Angus Reid poll uh, uh, just this past year put out this concerning wills. 69% of ages 35 to 44 don't have a will, 69%. 49% of ages 45 to 54 don't have a will. 39% of ages 55 to 64 don't have a will. 13% of ages 65 beyond that don't have a will. And it ends off by saying, 13% of those who have wills aren't even up to date. <laughs> That's kind of pathetic, okay? <laughs> All right? Now, uh, if you have a will, um, many say they don't have enough to worry about it. 
and so they don't have a will. Uh, this one I run into all the time. They think if they write a will, they're going to die. <laughs> I run into that one all the time. The others say wills are only for older people. Some of you say, well, I got plenty of time, and I say, yeah, right. Okay. Now, if you have a will, you, you, you need to be of the age of 18 to write a legal will, okay? If you're married or reasonably married or divorced, you need to have a will or redo your will. If you're a new parent, you need to have a, a will. If there's special family concerns, it can be reflected in that document. If you want to give a gift to the Lord's work, it can work in that document as well. And if your estate changes, you should consider changing it. We say to people, listen, consider, look at your document every five to seven years because you would be amazed how things change over time. Now, advantages of having a will? <laughs> Here's one. Avoids family conflicts. <laughs> I could tell you some, <laughs> some interesting stories, but let me put it this way. I know of loving Christian families that became not so loving and you guessed it, not so Christian, because mom and dad left nothing written behind. And the estate wasn't that big, okay? Controls the way assets are distributed, um, uh, provides for special circumstances, like if there was special needs, children, or things like that. Secures the future of minor children by naming guardian trustees. The, this, is, uh, this is an interesting one. If you're parents of minor children, you don't have a will, and both of you go, your kids become the property of the court. And the court will decide where your children go. Now, they may, they may pick the same person you have in mind, but there's no guarantee. You need to have a will in that situation as well as these other ones. Allows you to designate some assets to the Lord's work, and you can save estate money if you have your own will. In writing a will, here's what we would talk about. Who would be the executors? Who would be the guardians? Uh, when would you like your assets distributed? Uh, do you want to do a charitable donation? If you want to contact a lawyer, you can do it. You can even handwrite your own. Or if you want us to help you, uh, we're, we're here to do so. These areas need to be considered and, and, and looked at, okay? We do two types of wills. One is what we call the traditional will. And let me just take some time to show you when one spouse goes, everything goes to the second spouse. After both go, uh, an estate account has to be set up of all the assets that you've accumulated, and taxes and debts are paid out of that account. Whatever's left then goes, of that estate goes to the kids. That's what you call a traditional one. One spouse to the other spouse, after both go to the kids. Let me ask you a question. How long did it take your beneficiary to spend what you've laid aside now in your 80, 85 or so years. Okay, you've, you know, you've lasted six months. <laughs> All these nice things. But we also do what we call a charitable will. Let me sh share that one with you. One spouse goes, everything goes to the other spouse. When you both go, an estate account set up, taxes are paid, debts are paid, but we're encouraging our people, why don't you consider leaving something to the Lord's work? You supported the kingdom all your life, but when you both go, why not, why not leave something to the kingdom? Like the kingdom has big needs, great needs. In fact, uh, uh, a charitable will helps us reach lost people. That's the reason we're here, isn't it? Uh, helps us to perch, uh, to plant churches and ministries, helps us to train leaders, helps us with feeding the orphan and widows and feeding the hungry. Like a, a charitable will can facilitate a lot of good in the kingdom. So we say, why don't you give 10%? You pick the amount. There's nothing magical about 10. It's just that we give 10% tithe. Well, pick whatever amount you want. When you, whatever you choose to give, a tax receipt will come back to you for that donation, which increases what, some of what you took out to do kingdom work, okay? Something you might want to talk about. 
Um, God has blessed us. And uh, let me just conclude by, conclude by this uh, charitable will. God has blessed us in our lives. It's a personal philosophy of life, of being a good steward. We talked about laying up treasures in heaven. Here's another way we can do that. Demonstrate values to family members left behind. Provides a sense of self-satisfaction. We live all our days of service. Helps to offset taxes. And God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, if you would like to have an appointment, there's a sheet at the back and uh, there'll be somebody manning it and there's different slots of it that um, you can choose from. Um, it generally takes me an hour for a couple, uh, about 40 minutes, for whatever, um, and you will have your legal documents, you'll take your health care directors with you and your uh, power of attorney. We take the will, get it notarized, send it back to you, registered mail, keep an uh, electronic copy in case yours is ever lost. It's a service that we provide for all of our people across Canada. And uh, when you make your appointment, there will be a, a form sheet that you sh can fill out. It just helps us in to uh, facilitate the appointment a little bit quicker. I really appreciate being back here, all right? It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, come to churches and be able to talk to people. There's nobody better than God's family, all right? And I have the privilege of working within that family.